I'm a life skills teacher in the Everett School District. I have been here for 13 years. Um, we're going to talk today about how um, my team was able to incorporate POD into classroom instruction. Um, so I've got a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, special thanks to many of you probably familiar with Barb Lark. She has retired, but she was the speech therapist that um, got our team started with this and is still very much present with us. Um, Susan and Tammy are the two of the parents that I've been with for the last seven years, and Miss Sari is taking class today, but she um, has also been instrumental in a lot of what we do. We're going to be talking about um, how we began our work with POD, some of the ways we use it in the classroom, tips and ideas and encouragement, because it is it is an endeavor to take on, but it's something that we have found um, completely invaluable. I can't imagine teaching without it at this point. Uh, I had a nightmare where somebody messed up my pod, and I, I panicked and had to um, stop my presentation so that I could fix it before I could continue talking. Um, and then I do have some recommendations on what curriculum we use to do it as well. So a uh, little bit about the class, um, for those of you who aren't familiar. For over the past seven years, I've had between seven and ten students um, in the classroom. Uh, the two paraeducators that were listed have remained the same, and myself, we have had a variety of other paras come in over time. Any and all that come in do end up learning how to use POD. Um, it, it takes time, but it is something that we really truly um, have found invaluable, and those that come leave believing that it, it makes a difference for the kids. Uh, we have a variety of disabilities. We do have um, a significant number of students with autism. However, we do have some with other disabilities as well. And um, they, <coughs> excuse me, they, they pod also. In addition to a pod, which everybody has access to on their desk at all times, we may have an iPad or a Nova Chat or another AAC device, um, a more high-tech one, and a couple other features. Um, Core vocabulary is another one that we use in the classroom, and it's one that we have had uh, and is on the desk for the kids at all times as well. Okay, so how it all began. Our SLP started using it. Close the door, please, Susan. I'm on the, uh, sorry, my staff just came in. Uh, our SLP started using it doing contingent comments during class time. She had gone to the pod training um, and thought it was absolutely lovely started coming in because she did speech embedded in the classroom. Sari, do you want to mm -hmm. speak to that at all? Um, did you guys no, together I, that first time? Um, I don't think it's the first time, no. No, okay. But she was always embedding for speech, and so she came in and she started using this book with the kids. And so if we were doing um, one of our whole group lessons or something else, instead of taking the child to the back of the room to do speech, she would just sit down next to them and start parallel speaking with the child about the topic at hand. And we all thought that was infinitely interesting, um, and we're trying to figure out what was going on. So uh, at that point, when our interest was peaked, um, she presented the idea of using our learning improvement time on Friday afternoon to practice to practice our co our pod so we um we would use our lift time on Fridays and have a a nice safe place where we could all practice because what happens is when you take a look at this big giant book um, it gets to be pretty daunting, at least for it was for the, the classroom staff. Uh, An SLP could instantly see the power in it, but for us it was how do we do this without screwing it up and making it look like we have no clue what we're doing. Um, and what we learned was it really didn't matter if we knew what we were doing or not. Uh, but that time to talk to each other and to practice and to learn the merits of it, especially when we got clock hours for it. Our school district allowed her to, to um, apply for clock hours really made a difference. Um, and then it was uh, the building of the books, of course, because that, that takes time and it takes an investment. Um, we started with what we thought would work best. It wasn't exactly how they recommend to build them. Um, and it's always been a labor of love for us. We've written several grants in order to get the materials, uh, the color ink, the laminate and stuff. Um, and now it's just become a part of what we do. We've saved our old books. 
we've sent uh, several of them back for other teachers to check out and practice with, um, trying to share the wealth. But we're on, I think, our fourth generation of pods for students in the classroom, because we do also send the ones that the students have used along with them when they leave us. I didn't say that, but we are a one through five, so we can have the kids up and through fifth grade. So it took a long time once I, the kids had theirs. I still had to decide how, why, what I was going to do um, in terms of a group pod, because I was interested in it, but I really couldn't envision how I was going to teach it. Um, so I, when I had an intern, oh, lift time. Lift time is learning improvement Fridays in our school district. We, the students are released 75 minutes early, so we can collaborate as a team. Um, and that's the time that we use to do it. Sorry, that's not an acronym everybody's probably familiar with. I had to decide, back to my group pod, uh, how I was going to start this. I had an intern, so I had time to build it myself, um, which meant I got very familiar uh, with the setup um, and what it looked like. And when she was finishing up her time with us, it was time for me to go. So I just decided to start one day. Um, and I figured, you know, if I started small with one lesson, if it was ugly, it wouldn't be that bad. I've had other lessons that kind of fell apart, didn't turn out the way I wanted. So I started, and it was the most amazing thing I had ever seen that very first time I ever did it because I had not seen student engagement like that before. Uh, the kids understood more of what I processed, more of what I was saying simply because those pictures were there. I picked a whole group lesson, um, and it was it was related to our unique curriculum. So it has a lot of um, visuals with it as well. But I remember it had to do with colors. I think Sarah wasn't I saying colors and jelly beans? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I had pieces of paper and I had jelly beans and I had stuff everywhere because I still hadn't figured out how to manage using the core vocabulary at the same time, or not the core vocabulary, sorry, using the pod at the same time as all the other materials. So I was flipping back and forth and trying to toggle with the OMO and the computer, but it ended up being, for as much of a mess as everything looked at the, at the end of that lesson, it was just fantastic. And the kids were so excited. I remember we had a group of students, they all had their pods on their desk, and one student instantaneously started paying attention to whatever page I was on and turning his to that page. Um, he wasn't initiating a lot of speech or conversation related to it, but it loaned itself so well to having those contingent comments. Somebody would walk by, one of the parents would sit there and notice that he was on that page and thought, wow, look, he's paying attention, and he's, he's right along with what she's doing up there. So then once the parents saw me decide to do it, it made it kind of safer and easier for everybody to kind of just dive in. Um, and then the next thing I did was I asked a conversation after a question after lunch. Um, I, the kids, we were in a different building, or no, we weren't, but the kids, it's always a different group each year, started to ask them what they had for lunch because lunch is always a fun topic, and I don't like to talk about snack because I already know what they had for snack. But I would started to have a conversation with them, and I'd tell them what I had for lunch in the staff room. And then I would go around and let them tell me what they had for lunch. So we could just have some talk time. I still kind of knew what they were going to say, but it was lovely to just start with a couple of um, small things to see where it went um, and how it, how it was going to go. As this was going on, our SLP was still hanging out in the classroom um, and doing her therapy, not hanging out. She was actually working really, really hard. But she started doing more of the contingent comments, she would allow the kids to make some requests, um, and she would be able to um, parallel along with the curriculum that we were working on, um, digging right in there, um, and then the staff started to do as well. April, can I yeah. mention, um, something you were telling me about that first session, and you were talking about the contingent comments, and I just feel like mm -hmm. that's, that's fantastic, because one thing I see you guys doing is that, so if um, like your student was flipping through and looking at things. Oh, you're about to talk mm -hmm. about it, but <laughs> you'll oh, make, it, no, you'll make it work. Go ahead and talk about that one. No, that's, that's great. That so that... you're, you're going to make it work and you're going to, you're going to turn it into a conversation. So oh, I absolutely. love that you're going to talk more about that. Yeah. So here's an example of a, of a contingent comment. We had, um, 
we had we were doing a, a unit on community. Our thematic curriculum for that month talked about community. Um, and we were on the places page because we were exploring different places that had to do with um, the story we were reading. And there's a places page in your pod. So we had kids, and the staff had gone around and helped the kids turn to that page. And one of the students just kept trying to engage the paras in, I remember it was Susan or Tammy, in talking about Burger King. And very traditionally, some of us would have probably gone, no, I don't want to talk about Burger King. And instead, she said, do you really, do, do you like to go to Burger King? And he was insistent on talking about Burger King because that was a place that he visited in the community. Now, it wasn't necessarily exactly related to the curriculum we were doing, but what a beautiful thing for him to be able to comment because he was completely nonverbal on a place in the community that he liked to go that was related to our curriculum that he would not have had the po opportunity to do otherwise. Um, so when we talk about contingent comments, you know, somebody goes, that's cool, or comments on something else related to that, it doesn't take much for you to then use those, just those pages on that, you know, those cells on that page of the pod to make it relevant to what it is you're doing. Or even if it's off topic, another favorite story that we had was um, I've had a, a couple sets of, I've had a set of siblings. Um, and so we had both kids. Um, and the younger brother, I remember, he just kept telling uh, one day, Grandpa, Grandpa, Grandpa. And we usually know when grandpa's come, Grandma and Grandpa are coming to visit, but we had not heard anything about them coming to visit. And he kept going back to wanting to talk about that all day long. So his para keeps navigating back to that page, and he's talking about it. And she finally said, you know what, we need to, to find out if Grandpa's here. And lo and behold, Grandpa had come the day before. And he was so excited, he wanted to go home just to see Grandpa. So yes, it was not on topic, but it was a tremendous thing for him to initiate that communication and tell us something. And as soon as we said, well, Grandpa's here, and you were telling us the, the smile on that child's face that, yep, I told you, and you should probably listen to me more often when I'm telling you stuff. So I'm sorry about the intercom. Um, once we learned, once we began to use it, that you have to model it all the time, no matter what's going on. And we don't always do that correctly. But like I said, the power of those visuals for the engagement for the kids was tremendous. Um, once one person did it, others felt safe to try it. And I can tell you that now even um, substitute pairs that come in, they watch people start navigating with it, and they're like, well, show me how this works. I actually just got another intern um, this spring, and she's been watching and working with it. She took it home. She took it on a date and tried to have her date help her pod because she's trying to figure it out. But she already looked at me, and she said, so how do you teach if you don't have one of these in your classroom? because I'm not sure the kids would really pay attention and they certainly wouldn't have a whole lot that they could say to you. Because not only do I use the group pod, but when we approach the kids and when we're working with them, we will talk to them and model what we're saying on the pod on their desk at the very same time. So um, it's just kind of become a, a part of what we do. I had a, a, a good piece of video from many years about student behavior and noises. Because um, I have kids who will make different, you know, different shouts and sounds, and I'll say, "It looks like you're telling me something," and I will use that as a way to navigate to something in the pod and try and engage them in a conversation. Sometimes the noises are happy, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're trying to tell me something totally different. So I'll look to see what are they looking at, where are we in the pod, to see if they can. And if they won't tell me anything, I will still model what I think is going on. I had a young lady we got last year who, when she gets frustrated, gets what looks like very angry and starts to yell. And I finally looked at her one day and I said, I, I think you might be sad, but angry. She went sad. She's sad. Her sad doesn't necessarily what what I would consider sad, but it was so great to have her be able to tell me that, nope, that's how I'm feeling, um, and, and be validated for that. So the other ways I always... Uh, the layout always stays consistent. Nobody has less than 16 cells in their pod, Karen. Um, we found anything less than a 16, and actually everybody right now has a 20. Um, we found less than that would limit uh, the vocabulary for, that we used for model for modeling. Um, we try to have the layout stay the same. We do have some things. We have a student we're moving from PEX to pod, so we're adding some very specific pictures to his pod to help him make that transition. Um, but no, we don't tend to. Oh, sorry, I get questions on the page, and then I, I, I deviate sometimes. 
um, but we don't tend to do less than that. And the layout stays consistent in the books uh, just based on how they're built. So the other ways I always use pod during the school day, the whole group pod. Um, I'm going to introduce lessons and activities. I turn on my Elmo and project it up onto the screen. Um, instantaneously, I get twice as much attending from the students as you would as I would were I just to stand up in front of the room and talk, even if I'm looking at my schedule. Um, changes in the schedule and calendar. Observations about class. If they did something really, really great, um, if we're struggling, if it's loud, if it's feeling too warm, any and all of these things are great ways for me to model navigating. Um, and what's fun is the pair is because they place themselves around the room with the students will often um, either navigate with me or navigate to something else um, based on the kids' reactions. I have a couple of students who really, really dislike changes in the schedule. So they will use that as a way for the student to then um, express something else to them. And it says buzz off here because it's one of my favorite stories about POD. Um, this was about, I don't know, five or six years ago. We had a young man who he had a tear-proof pod because his favorite thing to do was to tear up paper. But it, he went from no communication when he started with us, no, um, no system, to leaving with a pod and an iPad that he could tell me whole sentences in. But one of the very first things that he ever learned to tell me, Sari, I'm sure you remember this friend, was he learned to tell me to buzz off. It's on page two. For those of you that are familiar with it, it's, it's a picture of a bee. But we consider that the nice way to say, please, please leave me alone right now, lady. Um, and so I, he one day just turned to that page after he'd been working with his pod with Barb for a while and told me to buzz off. And so I did for about 10 seconds. I said, okay, <laughs> I'm going to go. And I left for all of like 10 seconds. And then I turned around and I came back and I said, I'm back. Now what else are we going to do? And so we played that game for a little while, but he loved having the power to be able to tell me to go away, um, even if it was just for a brief period of time, and then I would come back. And I actually have another student right now who we're working on the very same thing. He doesn't like people encroaching on his space, and so he gets, he gets kind of handsy with people. Um, and we're working on teaching him to just tell people to go away in a much more kind manner. So that was always one of my favorite things, because... There's no other way a kid can tell you to go away beyond having that right there. It's, it's a very complex thing to be able to tell someone and navigating it, but it's right on those quick word pages at the beginning, and it had so much mm -hmm. power that he instantly bought onto, I kind of like this book. It does stuff for me. Mm -hmm. And you made it into a communication exchange too, in a way. I you did, because then I came back again and going said, so what else are we going to talk about? Is there something mm -hmm. else that you want to do with it? Um, which made a huge difference for him. So... Um, I get going, and, and I don't necessarily um, always stay on topic. So if somebody sees something I haven't hit and or has any questions, please go ahead and um, type those in as well. So what and how and what we model. Um, injuries and big feelings. We have a student who just recently um, ended up with an oral infection and had to have surgery. Um, and he, he doesn't really have a communication system. He's one that we've just started working with, um, POD. And so one of the big highlights since he had his surgery and he's been feeling so much better is we've been talking about ow and pain um, and the fact that he had pain in his mouth um, and, it, and wasn't really able to communicate that to people. Um, and it's taken him about, I don't know, he returned about a week and a half, two weeks ago, and this young man is very bright, but he was having pain today. Um, and we thought it was either his teeth or his ear, but he actually was attending to it and trying to help his para locate what was bothering him today. So injuries are a huge one. Um, that's why we work on learning body parts, navigating to that area. But then when we fall or we have a scratch or something, we tend to highlight that. And so you have an owl, that must hurt, and engage the child in what's on that page. Big feelings. Big feelings are behaviors, um, especially if they're interrupting in the classroom. So they're a really good one be, to help the kids um, and I, I say, you know, it looks like I have something to say. It looks like you're having a feeling. And so we'll go to that feeling in the pod and we'll talk about it. And if they can identify another one, like I said, my young lady, when I thought it was angry, was actually sad. Um, but it, it's always a great thing to do. And I have another student who has always been very uncomfortable with what she perceives as negative feelings, sad, unhappy, sick. She has this year, because we spend a lot of time talking about feelings, started to accept different kinds of feelings as well um, and been willing to talk about them a little bit more. 
Personal narrative writing. We do the Dave Madison writing um, district-wide for primary, um, and I took the training a few years ago, and we have found some really, really lovely ways to do personal narrative writing. Even if you don't use Dave Madison, we take um, photographs of things that the students do here at school because then we have a plethora of topics that we know that the students participated in, um, and we're able to use their devices and or their pods. And if theirs doesn't have enough vocabulary, I'm always willing to use mine as well because the, the, co the, the group pod has a lot more vocabulary in many areas. Um, but I will, um, we pull the pictures and we pull out a pod and we ask questions and we navigate through sections of the pod in order to pull the vocabulary for them to help do a narrative writing about the picture that they're looking at. Um, and because it's all narrative, it's about them, and they, they really tend to enjoy doing that kind of work. Um, interactive stories. I'm sure many of you have seen interactive stories in your, um, or have them in your district. It's the, the pull and tear off pictures for students that are nonverbal so that they can participate in reading. It's something that we tend to do um, almost daily in our classroom. And we um, do a lot of commenting and asking questions on that one. Sari, do you want to? that day we did with both was so much fun. Yeah. Sari, are you there? Okay, Sari was in a just are you there? I was talking yes. about that day so that you dry. came in and we, and we were playing with the with my two friends. Uh -huh. Yes, and we're using I love this example because um there's a lot going on with these interactive stories cuz like you said they're pull off and um, you can interact with the story that way. You've got a, a picture symbol with some of the high, important vocabulary on the page. And mm -hmm. then you've got your student who has a pod and an iPad. Or and pack. a core vocabulary. <laughs> and your core vocabulary board um, taped to the desk. And so I was a little overwhelmed, honestly, um, to come in, at, you know, just, just in the beginning, to thinking, where am I going to start with this? But then... Uh -huh. um, so, but there's no wrong, and you're you're great at just having people come and talk, and it doesn't matter what you do, you're interacting, and you're, and that's encouraged in your class. Well, and um, I I tend to go. Thank you. I tend to go back and forth between whatever tool I think has the vocabulary I'm looking for. We mm -hmm. were reading a book. We were reading Goodnight Gorilla because it happens to be one of these guys' favorite books, and we were so I naturally kind of went to emotions, and we were talking. I think that's silly. And then another friend that I was that was at that group really likes the sounds that the animals make. So I was trying to just kind of go back and forth, knowing the kids the way that I do, and engage them in some component of it that they could either comment on. Because I have I have kids whose IEP goals include commenting or asking questions about stories that we read. So it could be through the use of a rap board. It could be through the use of their iPad or their pod. I had a student last week who we were reading. And he'd done it in with somebody else two days before, but we got on a topic that he liked, and he just looked over and he hit that school. <laughs> and I thought, yay, mm -hmm. you commented all on your own. He'd done it a couple wow. days before, but was just so excited. Same student, we were uh, getting ready to take a break. And um, the day before, one of the pairs had shown him how to build a rocket out of magnet toys, and we had programmed his iPod, or his iPad, sorry, um, to do a countdown from 10 and a blast off. And so with both the iPad and the pot, he was trying to figure out how to tell us to count backwards because he was telling us what his plan was for playtime. And okay. he was going to want some help getting it all put together. So, yeah, and I just deviated. But all of the different things that the kids can then tell us because he could have spent 15 minutes trying to communicate to us what it was that he wanted to do. But he'd had so much fun, and we recalled it from a couple days ago that instead of... You know, well, we're not doing that right now. And that's really important. Don't tell the kids you're not doing that right now. See what it is that they're trying to talk to you about. It might not be perfectly related to the topic at hand, but is it better to keep on your topic or have them communicating something and bring it back around to what you're working on in your classroom or as an SLP? Uh, I know most SLPs are pretty phenomenal at doing that. Cooking is always a good one to do. Um, you'll see on the next slide, I have a lot of other vocab a lot of other communication systems within the classroom. Um, I think sometimes when people walk in, one of the things that they do is get overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that we have. Um, I April, don't actually have any. You're just yes. getting a little bit quiet. Oh, okay. I don't have anyone that actually has um, Pro Loquo, 
But the other photographs that you see here, one is our core vocabulary board. Uh, we just went from 40 to 49. We have kids who were on touch chat. Um, the one on the bottom right is a context board, and that's actually a cooking context board. So I might have that along with the students having their, their pods when we're doing this. And this is never me by myself. This is me with all of the paras, um, sometimes the SLP, and actually our OTPT. Um, he spent our first year when we did pod practice, we called it, um, just learning them why we wanted to do this and learning how to practice in a safe place. He spent that entire time learning it with us so that whenever he walks in the classroom to talk to a student or do anything, he is familiar with, the, with them um, and can navigate to talk to them using it as well, which meant everybody had that time and was on board. But it's never one person by themselves when we're working on it in the classroom. So yes, yeah, Sarah, the, the overwhelming is there's so much of it, but it works for just about everything we do in some mm -hmm. format. We did, and it says previously in specialists. I went back to this slide. We did previously take them to specialists. Um, transportation of our pods in the past was an issue because of the way we had built them. They weren't readily available to carry. We've just come up with a new version that includes um, PVC pipe with a U joint on the end with a string running through it. So we're going to work on taking it back to those locations again. Um, and I'm going to see if we can, I can spend some time, hopefully this fall or even the spring or next fall, working with the specialist to see if the kids could start just by making some requests or show them how the kids could do a comment so that they can start branching out and the pairs go with them. So I think in that situation it might lend itself for them to be able to start doing some more outside of class. And this isn't on a slide, but I have also had, um, we've also brought general ed kids in over the years um, to do different activities and play different games. And one of the things that we've found um, really, really meaningful, because I'll go talk in most of the classrooms in the fall um, just about our class um, and some of the things that they might see us around the building doing, is watching students learn how we navigate in, this, in, the, in the pod. Um, when they come into class or when we're out and about. I was at fifth grade camp with a student this fall, um, and we were at the meeting at the beginning of camp when we get out there, and he was so excited. He were, we were talking about all the different things, and he was talking about the animals that he might see and some of the sites um, just based on the pages in the pod. And the two ladies behind him and the lady, young lady next to him and the two boys in front of him, I think they spent more time watching this student and I have a conversation um, about camp and what he thought he was going to see and get to do than they did listen to the counselors. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a beautiful example of, because those kids could read those pictures and they knew exactly what he and I were talking about and they saw that he was navigating and sharing that and it wasn't just me. Mm. So April, this, that was huge. That is huge. That reminds me of a... I uh, saw a parent in the conference, and she said her son had an iPad, but when, they, when he had his pod hanging from the strap, more kids would come interact because they could see it and see how it was navigating, where they yeah. couldn't really see that on the iPad. That reminds me of yes. what you're saying. And that reminds me, when you went to, to the pod training, did, did you hear the, the conversation about the young lady in New Zealand who liked to use her pod better than her iPad? Mm, I don't remember. What they told me. She, because... She said, um, and she she had CP. She was um, she spoke at, at at an AT conference when she was in high school. But she said she liked to use her pod better because if she used her iPad, it took her a little while to compose a message, but it didn't require a communication partner. And so her friends would start talking to each other, and she would get left out. Mm -hmm. So her preference was to use the pod because all of her friends were communication partners in that case, and they did the navigating, so they stayed involved in the conversation with her. Mm -hmm. That, and I do find that sometimes my students will perseverate or will like to do particular things on their iPads um, that aren't necessarily communication. They like the pictures on a particular page. They like to perseverate on a sound. Um, and I do want them to learn them, and we use them almost as much as we use the pods. But if we're having a really tough day with it, I will turn it over or I will say, well, we're not going to use that right now. You have your other voice. And we always leave the pod on their desk just simply so they have one. But, um, yeah, I can see how carrying that around, because all, all kids have iPads. 
but not all of the kids have pods. And when they watch them start to navigate through them, it becomes a very interesting thing to take a look at. Okay, so, oh, did I miss anything on that slide? Yeah, just the fact that I, this is a very big team effort. This is not one person and this is not something. Um, and it's hard for me to say how you can get that engagement from your team. I have a team that's phenomenal in that. They, this is kind of our hill. This is the one that we've decided we're going to stand on and we're just going to be here because it means that much to us. Um, that we all spend a lot of time on, with the systems and, and using these. Uh, and we've made it a part of all the instruction that we do um, here as often as we can. So some of the curriculum that we use with POD, a uh, unique curriculum, if any of you are familiar with News to You, it's a thematic uh, theme unit that aligns some with the Common Core. Um, we use a three-year cycle of that, um, and there's a lot of things that you can do using that with your POD. Um, we'll navigate to particular things. We'll practice finding words. And some of these are not POD in that um, if you go to the POD training, they'd say that you really shouldn't be having the kids do navigation, but in the real world of our classroom, we find that sometimes it is necessary to work on teaching some of that stuff directly. So April, you're waiting, talking about like where to, where to find a word? Yeah, where to find it, um, even what some of the words mean. And that's where that tuned into learning on the second line comes in, is WH questions. How do you teach WH questions? And you have to look at the fact that our students, our students can, um, they have to learn all of this language. We can't expect that they know it. Um, and speech is lovely. I wouldn't survive without speech teachers in this world. But I don't see that 60 minutes a week is going to help them generalize um, and do the kind of communication that we're aiming for for them. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to ask WH questions and we're going to talk about all of these different things, we have to have more ways to practice getting to those places and learning that content. Tuned into Learning is a curriculum that's got um, auditory CDs with songs and then color photographs. And there's one whole book that's been my favorite for a few years that teaches questions like who and then tells you that who is a person, and then it asks a series of questions and provides color pictures. So we will practice, and I will pause each one and say, oh, it says who is in the bathtub, and there's a picture of a baby in the bathtub. So we have to remember that who is a person, um, and we might do who for a week. So it's just part of what's on our board, and we talk about it. And the staff will ask a lot of who questions during that week just to highlight it and generalize it as much as possible. Um, so then we'll practice navigating to answer who questions as an activity in class. Components of speech, we highlight um, because Unique has a lot of thematic um, stuff, but it also comes with color communication boards and visual is already a part of the curriculum. So we talk about the different components of speech and what they do or, or what they mean. So, you know, verbs are actions. They're things that we do. So we, we thank someone. We use something. We eat something. And so we can practice and we'll say, this is something that I do. So then I can go to the actions page in my pod and, and share that information, share where that word would be. Um, and this group, I don't have a lot of independent navigators, which is fine. You don't necessarily have to have students that are independent navigators. So your, your staff needs to then be able to help you turn to those pages. But in the past, I've even had navigators that would just automatically turn to the same page that I was going to um, as we were having these conversations about things. Um, literacy, sharing their opinion about books, comments, even if they tell you they don't like it. That's cool because they've told you they don't like it. Um, it's something, it's a comment. It's, it's, it's real. It's communication. Um, asking you to turn the page if they, want, if they think you're dwelling on something too long. Um, covering a particular picture. All of those things are ways that you can then say, oh, you're covering that. You don't like that picture? Or I really like this picture over here. And allowing that wait time to see what they can do. Um, one of the things I've noticed as I've been working with my intern this spring is how very much of what we do in the classroom and the way it's designed all relates back to POD and all relates back to the way their IEP goals and objectives are written. Um, simply allowing us to revisit those same goals and objectives during individual time, during small group time, during whole group time, um, and how integral their communication is a part of it. 
Um, and then I did talk some about using POD during personal narrative writing. We also have used it for opinion writing. Um, and we previously did do some um, informational writing with steps for things. We used some of our video models that we had done in the past um, and did some informational writing as well. Not as, I'm not as prolific and I don't do that as often, but um, I certainly have used it. Okay, Kristen or Sari, can you remind me how I talk over so that people can see my pod? <coughs> Please. So sorry. you can go to share on the top. By oh, that's right. Where it says stop me. Click it. Mm -hmm. All uh, applications or desktop? Share desktop, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, is it going to do that? It's not going. Um, so you're. Okay. Is your Elmo on? It's on. Yeah, it's um, on. It's on computer? Yeah. No, it's on It's on Elmo. It should be going, but it's not. I tell you what, I will take a couple photos of my pod. It's in a binder. It's not pretty. It's not what it should probably look like, um, but it, because um, it's not spiral bound. Uh, when I say it's not what it should be, it's not the way they pr prefer to have their pods put together. But I have added a lot of drawings over the years, and I am nobody's artist. Um, but it's well loved. I think it's on its fourth binder. I've had to reprint several of the pages because they um, have ma their maker. I've stepped on it. I've kicked it because it was in front of me. Um, my tabs are falling apart. And I consider remaking it every once in a while. But then I'd have to re <laughs> remake all the pictures, and I know where everything is in this one. So the ability to do that is something I'm going to have to get around to or just decide to um, and add those pieces with it. So we pod the best way we can. It is never going to be perfect, and it, it is never going to be exactly what we would like it to do to be, but we're trying. Um, and it is a lot of work. My ladies, my staff and I were looking over this when I put it together, um, and they said, you know, we forgot how much work it was when we started to do this. And we forgot when it was hard all the time to remember to include it in things. And we still forget to model as much as we should, and we still fall into to old habits of not doing it or not highlighting it as much. And we then have to remind ourselves and each other that that's a major component of what we're doing. Um, it's just it's part of what we're hoping to do for our students. Um, and they don't always look like true pods. I have some that have, like I said, three rings. Um, our newest version we really like, and it's much more durable. Um, putting them together is a labor of love. Um, I know it, it's just about as daunting as any other part of it, and it has meant that I do a lot of copying and cutting and prepping in the classroom because the ladies will spend every spare moment that they have during the day trying to build new pods. Um, we've been, like I said, creative about where we get our funding. We've gotten some special ed PTA grants. Um, I'm really fortunate our principal is lovely. We've invested a lot of our own money, all the binding and the U-joints and all the beads and the, everything that we have this time around. The ladies put beads on the end of the string, color-coded, so every child has a different set of colored beads, and they're a fidget that allow the kid to fidget with it but without messing up the pages in the pod. A brilliant idea on their part. Um, that's all personal funds because it's that important for us to, to have it as a part of what we do. Um, and like I said, we do require some level of navigational instruction as a part of class time to help the students facilitate practicing. I remember years ago we had a young lady who was quite independent in her navigation. She was um, just about finished with Edmark Level 1. Her understandability was pretty um, impacted when she spoke. And I remember one of the ladies finished reading with her and then wrote six of her new words she'd learned to read on the board and said, you can go find those in your pod and then you can go have playtime. Because it was very difficult for her to be understood. We knew she knew how to read them, but we wanted her to be able to find them so that if she was communicating with someone that was outside of our classroom, she, yeah, Sarah, go ahead and share the pod on the screen. Um, but she was able to then use the pod and eventually her iPad to navigate and tell people things at that point. So here's Ceres. And that's a, that's a 16. This is 16. And 
Is that on this Terraform? One, this is on, yep, the map paper. And this is okay. a, um, one from the Special Ed Technology Center for showing, so it doesn't have the oh, okay. that you have um, at the top. But I thought just in case you wanted to Yeah, show me see, and they say this isn't technically a pod because it's not bound, but we're doing it. We're trying. So, um, and do you have, is, are there any pictures added in this one, like on the backs of pages for things that people couldn't find content-wise? No, no, this one's um, like a model for just showing. Oh, it is just so a it model. doesn't. Okay. But we could talk about how you would do that because. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's say we, you know, and it's buzz off on the second page because that's always one of my favorite pictures for people to see. Is it on page two of Quick Words? I uh, know. It's not on that one. You have to be on the 20 to get the buzz off from my story. So those yeah. first two pages are your pragmatic or your quick words page, and then Sarah's on the pragmatic branching page. So let's say I had a student who was who's being funny, and I the other day he was doing something, um, and I said I had more to say. And so then I went to my page two, and he some more to say. And so I went to page two, and I said you're doing something, and I don't like it. So we went to 4C, where you guys can see that, you know, I don't like this. Um, and I really didn't like what he was doing. He's decided that blowing his nose on his hand for the noise that it makes is really, really fun. And I said, I think you, and he, before I even got through the sentence, and he said, I'm being naughty. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think you, and I was going to say we're being noisy, and he looked at me, smiled, and touched naughty, and then giggled. <laughs> <laughs> He likes that. <laughs> he thought it was awesome that he could tell me that. I thought, yeah, yeah, you are being naughty. I really don't like it. I said, I said, I think it's gross. I think it's gross. You're blowing your nose on your hand, and he laughed at me again. But <laughs> so I think that's gross, and he just chuckled. <clears throat> so, um, but and then I told his mom that story, and she thought it was absolutely fantastic that he could tell me he was naughty, and I could tell him it was gross. <laughs> and we could have that exchange with each other about what he was doing at the time. But so say I couldn't find the word that I wanted on here. So sorry, you could turn the page. Okay. Here it says turn the page okay. in the bottom corner. So your word isn't there, so you're going to turn the page. And you could go and say you wanted another word that would go with I don't like that. And you can't see it on this page either. It says go to list at the bottom of that second page in the blue. And if you turn to the back then of that next page, this is where you need to have a good couple of Sharpies available for you at all times. Um, nice fine points if that's what you want because you just draw your picture right there on the back of that piece of paper um, and label it. And what I found is sometimes those are the most meaningful. And we'll go around and we'll draw them in the kids' books too if they don't have, that, if they don't have the, the stuff that we need. Um, Oh, I'm so glad your student told you he was being naughty. You can tell him he doesn't get to have it, um, and he could find another way to ask, but that is an awesome story, Teresa. She said that one of my students was tantruming to get access to a furred item, and he told me he was being naughty. He recognized it, and he told you, so then you could have a conversation about a nice way for him to ask you to have, to ask you to have it. Not necessarily that he'd get it, or you could tell him when you're finished, um, but what a cool exchange that you had. So yeah, I would just draw it right on the back of the page there. And I found that it's so glad strategy to be able to draw that picture right in front of the students too, that they really, really enjoy that. There are different activities I do during the day that I will just draw parts of it for the kids too. I'll do a, a separate three-part sub-schedule for different components during our day. Um, but they get to the point, and I have kids who might want to turn through the book and talk about it, so I'll try and go by and say, well, we're not turning for fun, but if you had something you wanted to tell me on this page... Um, I'll do that as well. Thank you, Sari, for showing us that one. I wish I could get my group one up. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, I will take some pictures of it um, and make those available or even get a little bit of video of me doing an introduction during the day. So back to this. Uh, the real world of our classroom means that instruction isn't always as it should be, but we're continually trying. And our students really do learn quite a bit um, and we see on a daily basis. Somebody once asked me, um, about research-based best practice. And POD is not. I'm going to get really emotional. Sorry. Um, but it is for us because our kids um, have learned more and done more having this in our classroom than just about anything I've done in my 20 years of teaching. Um, 
having this available. I can't imagine uh, teaching without it anymore. So, okay. So suggestions from us to you if you were trying to do this. And I know I saw a lot of SLPs uh, taking the class today. If you are struggling on how to get your teacher to buy into it, uh, try again. Contact me. Um, find somebody else who does it. Or ask if you can come in and do that contingent comment thing. Sit next to that student. Um, don't make it a, you know, a loud part of sp a speech or what's going on in the classroom. Um, for those of you that know Barb, she has such a lovely demeanor in how she does things with the kids that part of it was they were so engaged when they were sitting with her doing that, and it was such a part of what I was teaching. I thought, what is she doing? Because that is cool, and I want to know what it is. Um, and the paras were instantaneously taken with it. So um, I know that, that that's something that is difficult to do, but we found the best way to help our kids is to treat the whole kid. Speech cannot happen in a bubble, um, and it needs to be a part of, of every day. The books take time to make. It is your biggest obstacle. Be creative in how you outsource it. One year I had a, a parent, I actually still have her as a parent in my classroom. She works at another high school in another district, but she had leadership students who needed volunteer hours. So they got to cut out laminated pod pages. Um, they got hours and we had free labor. Uh, we've had people from retirement facilities. We've had parents who came to the school, um, substitutes that didn't have something to do that we've handed it to. Um, and then just every spare moment, we take it home at night and work on it. Or I have one lady who loves it so much, she'll stay here till 5 o'clock some days and take care of it. Um, believe that it will make a difference and give it time. It is not going to be something that starts overnight. And I think, Sarah, you were saying sometimes when you come in, it's overwhelming the amount of stuff. It's taken us years to get to where we are with all of the things that we do. It's not perfect. Jody, you came and you saw some of it as well, one of the other people that's taking the class today. Um, and we're trying. It's always, it's always in flux and it's always in development, but it's important to us. Um, and just when you want to give up, somebody does something and you get goosebumps and you get so excited by it. Um, and this next one I had here, it doesn't happen in isolation. Your entire team has to have that buy-in um, and make it a part of what's going on. And sometimes it does take that leadership role of you being the one to get up and do it first, to you know be willing to look like you know look you know for lack of a better word look like the guinea pig, and try it out. And if you crash and burn, okay, you crashed and burned. But that crash and burn meant everybody else might be okay trying it too. Um, if somebody screams in class, look at them and say, "It looks like you have something you want to tell me." Use any and all things that your kids are doing to have a conversation because that will lead to a back and forth. My kid's blowing his nose in his hand. He thinks it's really funny. We had a wonderful back and forth conversation and then we went back to work. But isn't that what we're really hoping for for our kiddos is that kind of participation in what goes on in their, in their world. Um, and my very favorite quote, or everybody's favorite quote in this classroom, it isn't communication if I know what you're going to say. It's not. They they want to say things. They have things that they want to tell us. Um, and if we're not providing them ample opportunities in a million different ways to tell us things, then they're never going to. Um, but I have so many fun stories of what they have told us. That and don't ever forget to model because it's really all you're going to do. Um, so I think that's about it. Sari, Kristen, is there anything else that you can think of that I've talked to you guys about that I didn't? talk about in the last 50 minutes here. I think you really covered it, April. Um, yeah. any, I feel like, it's, does anybody else have any questions? Is there something that they were hoping that I didn't necessarily hit on today? And I do apologize for not having video. I will work on some. Uh, there's going to be a, a video of it or a recording. Yes, Sari? I do have a question. When you guys started your list, um, that learning improvement time where you had the time uh -huh. off of, without students, at what point, uh -huh. after, you know, when you were starting the practice and learning about it, at what point did you start implementing it in class besides when your SLP was modeling it? Probably a couple of months. I needed okay. some time to practice it as well and just be used to it. Um, I needed to, to get over the hump of trying, it new, uh, trying something that big as well. 
Um, mm-hmm. the, re- the, the next few things that we adopted after that, the core and the other components, because POD ended up being so successful and meaningful to how we instruct in the classroom, were a lot easier. But that first one took some time. I mm-hmm. think we did lift that spring, and then in the fall I had my intern, and just as she finished up teaching, uh, so it probably had to be been October, November, um, was when I decided, okay, forget it. It's just now or never. I've got to try mm-hmm. this. Looks like you have another question, too. Yeah. Um, so Brittany is asking about uh, – I'm sorry, somebody else asked a question before Brittany did. Do the do students have, have a primary communication system or do they use POD plus core plus iPad? Uh, everybody has – most of them come in with, with something. I had one student come in with PECs. Most of them have come in with um, – I had two come in with, one come in with an iPad in the last few years. Otherwise, no, the majority of them came in with no um, particular communication system. Some of them had previous PECs training, but they didn't come with anything when they came to me. So everybody gets POD when they come in. I have a couple kiddos who are verbal, but they still use that as well. Uh, I have two students with student-specific iPads, correct, Sari? Mm-hmm. And then one more that we're trialing, but he's moving from PECs to POD at the same time as we're trialing the iPad. Um, official pod trainings are very infrequent. There was one last year, Brittany, in Kitsap. Um, the other way we got the training was just through our SLP. Um, Sarah, do you know of other trainings for people? Or I was just posting. Pod? Yeah, there's um, there, Linda Burkhardt's going to offer one in May, the end of May in Portland. Oh, really? Oh, cool. Um, <coughs> they, are, they are kind of tricky to, to get to. Um, they are. You had a question about um, using it with Edmark. Oh, um, we, we sometimes used it with Edmark. That was the student that was having to practice to find the words because she'd added some words and they were hard to understand her CA, understand when she was speaking them. So we just had her practice finding them so mm-hmm. that she could do it. Um, all of the reading that we do, we still have the kids do it so that it doesn't require verbalization in order to be able to do it. But as you're reading words, it's great if you can find them also. Okay. So and then you had just a push question about um, someone who has five kindergarten students in their class, and do you uh-huh. use a beginning pod book with three younger students? So I've used a like? nine. I've used a 9 and I've used a 12. I found that the difficulty with the 9 and the 12, and Sarah, you can speak to this too, because I know you go all over our district and, and talk to teachers about different ones. Mm-hmm. We found the 9 and the 12 really kind of limiting. They were big, and they didn't have a lot of vocabulary. Um, so as we were trying to model things, we were limited in what it was that we could say. Mm-hmm. Um, we did have... Um, our lovely former SLP, was able to shrink a 20 down to make the size smaller so it's not a full page size, um, which makes using it with the kiddos a lot easier because it cuts down on the weight and the size of it. But I use my 20 cell with the whole, with the whole class from the time that they are brand new first graders when they enter the class. Um, I figure a lot of language and vocabulary gets them receptively. Um, some have started with a 16. This last round, when we started looking, we just moved everybody to a 20. And I'm sure I will have years where I need to bring 16s back in, or even 12. Um, we find that we save them, or we send them off to Sari at the AT lab so that they're there for checkout. Um, it yes, means we're we sharing the wealth. What? Yes, we love you for that. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's sharing <laughs> the wealth. It's making sure that yeah. somebody else has something to trial. Um, mm-hmm. because building it and then not having it work or building it and then not getting the buy-in is a frustrating thing. But getting handed one that you could practice with to start seeing the power in it is a tremendously valuable tool. Another thing about your nine cells, April, is it true that if you have fewer um, cells on your page, you're kind of digging a lot deeper to get to what you want to say? Was that hard oh, at all? Or yeah. was it mostly that, that you didn't have the vocabulary? I didn't have the vocabulary. Even when I wanted to have a little lunch conversation with the kiddos that were on the 12, there were no picture, wor- no words that had to do with lunch that they could actually tell me anything. It was, you know, it was a lot of the verbs and actions, you know, you ate, but then I'd have to pull mine to get to some of the vocabulary for other components of it. Even the emotions, there were only a few. Um, so we found, and that's fine. If, and uh, as I say that, I also know that I left that 12 on that particular student's desk for 
three years and we used that, we just supplemented with someone else's that we borrowed or mine so that we could, um, yes? Oh, no, go ahead. We, so that we could use both and we had enough vocabulary present. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's Bernadette. a question about, yeah, using the core board. There's a, yes, there's core on the desk. We use, um, we use core with just about everything. Um, even when we're reading our unique stories at the communication board, the things that aren't um, on the communication board for the unique stories tend to be on the core board. So we go back and forth and we use almost all of them. I've got core boards taped to the toy cupboards and back by the computer, and then everybody has one on their desk so that we can use those as well. And we have big ones for pull-off that we've been doing instruction on. I actually, Kristen, when is that webinar I'm redoing on, the po on using core in the classroom? Let me well, look and I'll type it. Okay, excellent. Yes, my pairs were able to be here, get paid, and get clock hours to practice pod during lift time, and it meant that they could um, get some practice in a safe place. Is there a follow-through when you get to the middle school? Sometimes there's follow-through when we get to the middle school. Um, there's becoming more and more because it's in their iPod, in their in their IEPs, um, and the mm -hmm. SLPs are there. And Sari tends to follow my students up as they go. Um, we also just were fortunate enough this fall. Our director decided we should do some pod training. So Sari and I and Barb did a two-day training, and that was through high school, wasn't it, Sari? Mm-hmm. Any yeah, we did yeah, a, two model. days of a three-day training on pod, and she has expressed. I talked to her the other day. She has expressed some interest in um, wanting to continue some training in the future. She was actually part of, um, she was actually instrumental in helping pay for me to finally get to go to training. She covered the sub, and my principal paid for the, for the conference for me to be able to go finally. Oh, thank you for the, uh, the core classes on the 16th. Oh, and some people are using it in secondary. I'm so glad. Uh, Center-specific pods or activity-specific? Nope, everybody has one. Students have one, teachers have one. Um, the context board that you saw about cooking, we have a lot of context boards. We've got context boards for games. We've got them for cooking, all sorts of different activities. We still bring those out and use them. We don't put them in the pod because you don't add to it. Um, thank you for going to that slide. The one on the far right is our cooking board. Um, we don't put it into it. We just add it to what we're already doing. So that's the question about um, activity specific. My room is full of picture boards, everybody. Big difference between the group and individual pod. Yes, there is a lot more vocabulary in the group pod. There's a lot more conversation pieces. We're trying to figure out how to add. The student pods don't have a religion page, but I have a student, um, and this is good cultural relevance. I have a student who church is a very big part of his life, so we're working on develop how to figure out how to transfer some of the stuff from the group pod and size it down so that we can fit it in his because it's a major component in his life. And we've had goals written about it. Oh, those of you that do TPEP, if you want to implement pod, I actually um, didn't do it for pod but for core. When I had uh, my comprehensive year for uh, TPEP, I was able to write a goal for C3, C6, and C8 and um, use all of the work that I was doing when I was implementing something new like that in my classroom that's really difficult to do my comprehensive TPEP. So uh, think about how you can use your time when you have all these other things going on, um, implementing something new in your classroom, uh, and make it help you in your professional development as well. That I had forgotten to do. Uh, any other questions? And yay, Ellen, I'm so glad it's going well in secondary. It's hard to give up those books because then it means you're making new ones for the kids coming in, but it does tend to be worth it. Um, and we've just now started to figure out some ways to make sure that we get that funded for, for people as the kids move on so that it's not coming out of our pockets forever. Yes, Bernadette, I will get some video. Sari will s schedule some time for you to come and do that, right? So, oh, Sari got turned off, so she is... Um, going to work on coming and getting some video for us. Did I make the pods to the website? No, you have to purchase the pod disc. Um, and at the time, Barb was my SLP, um, and she purchased it. So you have to have a board maker disc. Unfortunately, the pod disc um, with all of the templates on it 
does not work with BoardMaker online. They know that it's a difficulty, um, and if you have a, a, an old disk, don't get rid of it. That's my suggestion to you. You have to purchase the pod disk, and it has all the templates. There are phenomenal pods for, there's high contrast ones for students with visual impairments. There are um, ones for auditory scanners. There's a tremendous amount of work that's gone into it. Um, CPEC and the stuff that they showed, showed um, Oh, they're not selling it right now. They were in the fall. Sari, can you send me a message and let me know? Because I thought you just bought the disc not too um, long ago. Yeah, that's true. They, they aren't selling it right now. So I was, I'm was i signed up to go to the two-day with Linda Burkhart in Portland, and I'm going to ask her specifically about it. <laughs> well, because when I had training with Linda last year, she um, she said it wasn't available just yet. But then I thought you and I looked in the fall, and it was it was available. Oh, the um, alternative access, yes, but the um, regular oh, pod. But not the whole is, one. Right now the regular pod um, is right. not. Yeah, and see, I'm actually holding out and going to personally buy it when it becomes available again because I need to own it for myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm happy where I am, but if I ever choose, I, I don't know how to teach, like I said, how I teach any other way. So that's a big part of it. Okay, Spectronics in Australia? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can put something out about how um, how you can access it or if when it will be available. But if you can find out, Sarah, that might be information people would be interested in. I will. Okay. All right. Okay, SATC. Oh, SATC has podcasts on trial. Kristen, that's fabulous. Oh, I think awesome. we have three... Uh, kits of different types of pods. Karen, okay. I think you spearheaded creating some of those. So um, those you can loan for a month while you're getting your pods going and see. We have four kits, cool. Karen says. Nice. So, yeah, and that, like I said, I've given Sari, and Sari's printed some, and she gets them through Setsy, but we've we've sent our old ones, and they're not in good shape, but we've sent our old ones up to um, the AT lab here in the district to let people borrow to try out before they decide if they want to put in the time um, to make their own. We don't have a group available, but the, the student ones are there. So, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kristen and Sari, for all your help, and Teresa. Um, and thank and you, you uh, April, get a, once again. Yeah. Wonderful. If you didn't get a question answered, let me know. Oh, Melon says it's now available as of today. Oh, wow. Thanks, Ellen. But it's that up to 300. Me. Yeah, awesome. I'm going to have to take a peek at figuring out how to get that this week. Hot off the presses. It's available through Mayor Johnson. Look Thank at you. that. Everybody's helping us out today. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for taking the class. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you all, all for joining. All right. Thank and you. And I'll send out the handout, um, be a PDF, and I can attach the recording once I do a few edits. And April, let me know if there's anything. Um, but um, I don't really think there's much editing that needs to happen. It's a great, great okay, presentation. Excellent. Thank you. And then I will work on some video, and I'll get a hold of Kristen on how we can try and get them out for people to take a peek at some of it. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.